Okay, well today is a special day. Uh, it's known in the Hebrew circles as a day called Shemini Atzerit, the eighth day. And we're going to talk about it. We just came out of a feast. So, first of all, let me just say uh, shalom and welcome everyone shalom. to my little teaching. Shalom. <laughs> So we have just finished celebrating Yahovah's Fall Feast, and it's called Sukkot, the Feast of Sukkot. And it lasted seven days. We are now starting the eighth day at sunset. We are now going into the eighth day. That's how Hebrew reckons time. It's Hebrew reckoning of time. It starts in the evening. So today is the eighth day. So what is Sukkot? Sukkot is the plural for the Hebrew word sukkah. And a sukkah is a small temporary dwelling built with available materials. The roof must be made with organic materials. You can eat, relax, worship, and sleep in this dwelling for seven days. And it's translated as booth or tabernacle. So when you have a bunch of sukkahs, which they would put on the hillsides of Jerusalem. Everybody would come up to go to the feast day. You'd have all these tabernacles, and we would call it Sukkot, the Feast of Sukkot. But in English, booth or tra translation, booth, tabernacles, that works out. So that's what a basic sukkah looks like. So Yahovah our Elohim, our God, He has set aside several special days on His calendar to meet with us. If you're truly wanting to learn more about our Creator, then take time and join others in worship and study on these special set-apart days. These holy days have significant meanings that reveal His kingdom. So besides just knowing to celebrate the days, they, they do truly have deeper meanings in not only the time they're placed, but the first set of feasts that happened in the spring, when Jesus or Yeshua was here, He actually fulfilled some particular things that were supposed to happen for our salvation during those feasts. The fall feasts are for His second coming. We don't know how those are all going to play out, but we, we're rehearsing every time that we go ahead and we celebrate these feasts. We're rehearsing because we're loyal to Yahovah and we follow His commandments. So what's the significance of this day? Many believe since it's called the eighth day that it must be part of the festival of Sukkot. And like I said, Sukkot is also known as Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. There's one problem with this thought. Because Sukkot is clearly defined as a seven-day feast in Scripture. So we're going to use some references and we're going to take a look at Leviticus 23 and Deuteronomy 16. Now in Leviticus 23, uh, verse 34, it reads, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of this seventh month, shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days unto Yahovah. And then in Deuteronomy, verse 13, 16, 13, it says, You shall observe the Feast of Tabernacles seven days when you have gathered from your threshing floor and from your wine press. Now that's very interesting. Besides defining the seven days, he wants you to make sure you've gathered from your threshing floor and your wine press before you come up to Jerusalem. And what does that really mean? Well, this reference actually means to bring your grain, the wheat from the threshing floor, and wine, your grapes, up to the feast. These are the blessings from your wheat and grape harvests. We threshing floor and wine press kind of set off some bells? Uh, yeah. You're going to get that. Well, I, this, this goes deep enough without going, I, yeah, I, I'm like you, I could have, I kept adding stuff and trying to, so we must be counting in order to know how long the feast lasts. 
All right, so there, you start on the first day and you count seven days. That way you know when you stop sleeping in sukkahs, right? Our Elohim has taught us to count up to seven. Seven is a set-apart number that reflects His perfection. It's the basic repeating pattern to the Hebrew experience. Israel was instructed to count several types of sevens to track time. Sabbaths, Shemitahs, and Jubilees. So we're going to talk about those for anybody that's foreign to those words and they'll, they'll be easily understood. So a menorah lampstand, it actually has seven lamps, even though we call it a lampstand. All right? So the lampstand has seven lights or seven lamps on top. In Revelation 1, 12, and 13, when I turned to see who was speaking to me, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man. He was wearing a long robe with a gold sash across his chest. So they're mentioning these seven of these golden lampstands. Hebrews are good at counting to seven. Okay, so the menorah represents. <laughs> The menorah represents, it's in the holy place, it represents seven. Our Heavenly Father has asked us to count six days and then rest and commune with Him on the seventh day and then start counting over again. Thus, the weekly cycle structure that the whole world recognizes. And here it is, except we look at it a little differently. We call it our Sabbath cycle. And a day is broken up in 24 hours, but it is subdivided into two parts. And since I was telling you that we start our day at night in the evening, we would have our night first, then the day, and then at twilight, the next even, we would start night again. All right? So we'd have one day pass, and in that 24-hour period, you go 6 times 24, you get the number 144. Hmm, very interesting. And if you divide the 6 days up to our Sabbath, if you divide the 6 days up to our Sabbath into 12 parts, 6, divided, six times 2 parts, you get 12 tribes. And if every hour in the 12th section is worth 1,000, that's 12,000 sealed in each tribe, giving you the 144,000. That's a lot of math. <laughs> Yahovah <laughs> is full of math. Huh? Yeah, <laughs> well, that's just the structure inside this cycle. Okay? That's cool, though. That's very cool. So, I just happened to stumble across that. <laughs> <laughs> so, the next thing we're going to talk about is the Shemitah cycle. So, if we look back, I guess I may, may have moved too quick. The Sabbath cycle, we had the seventh day, that was our Sabbath. The Shemitah cycle, we're going to have a similar pattern with the Sabbath. We're going to count six years, and the seventh year is the Sabbath for the land. Instead of a, like we have a Sabbath for us on the seventh day, the seventh year is the Sabbath for the land. And now if you look at each year, it is broken into two cycles. And Scripture only talks about summers and winters, all right? And the summer, then the winter, and then you start summer again. We'll talk a little bit about that. You have 12 seasons in consisting of the six years. So... so can I just ask that? How sure. do you have fall feasts? Well, we, define, we, we call things spring and fall oh, okay. because we have those extra seasons in there. So, yeah, we know there's four seasons. But those markers, we'll talk about where I have the lines defining summer, and then we go back to winter. I'll show you what those are. If you want to sow at the right times and reap the plentiful harvest, you must keep track of the seasons. If you just decide, I'm going to plant, and you don't plant at the right time, you're not going to have a harvest, okay? And that's dictated by, with God's help, He showed us the seasons and He showed us how to identify them. So what we call fall and spring are transitions. Yes, they're transitions. 
So the way you know that summer is about to begin, and Yeshua would say you can see that the trees are budding, right? Well, that's happening at the vernal equinox, and that would be the start of the, we would call it the spring equinox, that's what they call it, but it's called the vernal equinox. It's the start, and that is the mark for spring in through summer up to the autonomal equinox. So your summer fits in between there. So you've got uh, vernal equinox marks the beginning of summer, and the autonomal equinox marks its end. So where that marker is there right in the middle of the year, that is the end of summer. Then, if you go into the middle of winter, there's the thing that's in between are called solstices. All right? Solstices are different than equinox. Equinox means that the day and night are equal. All right? God likes that balance. That's the marker. So when the sun comes back down to the equator and day and night are equal, that is known in Hebrew as the takufa. Okay? That is the marker. And that would be the vernal equinox. Then the sun goes above the, above the equator, it peaks out, and then it comes back down. And when it comes back down and crosses the equator again, that is called the autonomal equinox. So Keith, you have suggested to us on the previous slide that we have a six to seven day cycle for the weekly cycle where we work for six days and then rest on the seventh. What is implied here? So we're going we're gonna to farm the land for six years, and on the seventh year, we're going to call that the Shemitah year, it's the Shemitah cycle, you do not plant anything in the land and you let the land rest. That was a commandment. But he promised in the years prior to the Sabbath year that he would give you extra abundance and you would store some of that grain away to get you through that Sabbath year and like take you, manna. huh? Like the manna. Exactly. Like the manna. <laughs> She's my helper. She's all right. <laughs> so we are to count six years, rest on rest the land on the seventh year, and then start counting over again. Thus, a Shemitah year is noted. This is a mystery to the world, as most Hebrews, they don't even know which Shemitah count we're actually on. Okay, because they stopped doing it even now in Israel they don't really rest the land okay so there's a reason we were supposed to keep track of these if we would have followed his instructions explicitly we'd know exactly where we were on his calendar and I'll, I'll talk a little more about that so Keith and then certain Jews that say exactly from that Shemitah year was in 19 you know uh, 2000 yeah, they, they the, the, well, they're speculating. They're speculating because something wonderful happened with Israel or the Jewish people, so this must have been a marker. Well, That's I'm what they're some, doing. Some teachers will suggest something wonderful happened. This must be a Shemitah year. You'll hear others say something terrible happened. That must be a Shemitah year. They're not even sure whether right. Shemitah year is something wonderful or something terrible. I don't uh -huh. know. I mean, exactly. But and there are some Jews in Israel now who actually observe the Shemitah year, but there are different times. Different mm -hmm. groups will have different ideas. They're trying to do it, but right. nobody's in sync because nobody knows what it is. At least we have something to fight about. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, so we've talked about how we define a Sabbath. We talked about this new count. It's very similar to the Sabbath count called the Shemitah. All right? And that's basically for the land, but it's a marker. Every seven years, you place a marker, and then you start on the. You don't really go to an eighth year. You don't count eight. You start one again, two again, three again, and you continue on. You never. We never moved forward to eight. Well, Keith, I'm sorry. I just want to add. Since we're since most places in the world for quite a while now have not been based on an agrarian economy and agrarian society, where most people are landowners growing crops. Right. How would you? your opinion, interpret the Shemitah year for a person who works or something like that instead of being a farmer? Is there any significance for people who are not farmers? Well, I don't know. I mean, if you try to take take a year off doing from what you're doing, you better have saved a I lot think, of money. I think also a lot of this was uh, 
commanded once they were given the land. Mm -hmm. Right. right. Now we are in this dispersion. Yeah. There, there you I go. Think, uh, and I'm not suggesting that everyone should take the seventh year off from work. <laughs> it sure would be nice. It's it's a, nice. Here's a vacation. Where you get the, the word sabbatical from. Yeah. And that was in, in our higher institutions of learning for hundreds of years. That every seventh year, the professors would take time off. That's where the adjunct professor came from. I think even though they don't know when that that Shemitah year is, it's still, sh I think, have sh they've shown it to be practical not to farm. Right, give your land the rest, yes. Yeah, it is still beneficial to the land. Every once in a while, and or it has no minerals and nutrients for the plants to grow. Mm -hmm. And it's not about resting from work, it's resting from the land from work. Right, but he, what Alan was asking, since we don't, we're not farmers. It, a farmer wouldn't do anything. Right, because he doesn't have to go out to the crops. I mean, he would still f find some things to do, and then I just made the comment, I don't yeah. know, you know, it, it would be, we'd have to pony up some resources sure. and save to... Is that too, like, they would wipe out that time, they would wipe out, like, any debt that they would... No, have not yet. Yeah, well, not yet. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll talk. This is the year of the Jubilee, so... No, so you know what? Hold on, I apologize. Uh, the, actually, if I remember... Well, correctly, slaves got to go back... It's free slaves. Uh, uh, anyone who was involved in indentured servitude, uh -huh. not exactly slavery right. per se. And also, uh, there was a hold on the collection of debt payment. Correct. Right. Not a cancellation of debt, but a hold on payment. So if you were, you know, if you were a debt holder, you would not force your debtors to pay in the seventh. Well, it only makes sense. Your agriculture isn't making you any money. How are you going to make any payments? You're not farming that year, right? I have an right? idea about what you said about we're not in an agrarian society. When they were in Egypt, they had to work, what was that, like 10? They didn't get days off. Right, yeah. So I think that we're in Egypt and we don't get that off. That and then God actually like, punishes them for not observing that as right. well. And that's why it's, I think that, I mean, I've just been learning this, so this is amazing that you're talking about this tonight because John and I have just been saying we really we need to know this uh -huh. because, I mean, everything that I've heard, we should really be following that calendar and not the pagan calendar and that that's how you know when really the signs for when God is going to return. Right. And so... Well, I, that's, that's where I'm trying to go. I'm trying to get... I wasn't making this an all-encompassing teaching on counting sevens, but just enough so we could get through it so you could see some patterns I'm going to try to identify for you. So you've got the Sabbath, the Shemitahs, and now a Jubilee. We're going to go to Scripture here to talk about the year of the Jubilee. In Scripture, Leviticus 25, 8 through 10 reads, You are to count seven Sabbaths of years. Okay? So seven Sabbaths of years, that Shemitah is seven... Uh, is one Sabbath for the years, right? You're going to count seven of those. Seven times seven years, so the time is a total of 49 years, okay? So that she Shemitah pattern I showed you, every seven years there's a marker called the Shemitah or a Sabbath for the land. You're going to count seven of those Sabbaths for the land and end up at 49 years. Then, on the 10th day of the seventh month, on the Day of Atonement, you are to sound a shofar all throughout your land. You are to make the 50th year holy and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. Now that's just the basic scripture there, just helping you see the count that it's been identified. You're supposed to count seven of those Shemitahs, and then the next year is a Jubilee. It is like the grand count. It's, it's basically you release uh, people from their debts. If you sold some land, it comes back to its rightful owners. So there's a lot of stuff that goes on. And without going into all the depth of all the privileges that happen on the Jubilee year, I just wanted so we can talk that there is a Jubilee identified in Scripture. And this is what the cycle would look like. The green is the Shemitahs. You are to count seven Shemitah cycles and then proclaim the following year to be a Jubilee. So if you count the green, one, two, three, four, five, you know what? I did this on purpose. 
one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The next year is the Jubilee. Then you st that would be your 50 marker. That'd be the 50th year. Then you start over again. You start counting one, two, three, four, five, six, new Shemitah. And then you would continue on in time. And then these Jubilees would be markers of 50 that you have recorded in time. Boy, if you, if you lose count and you missed it, you are up a creek. Uh, we <laughs> have. <laughs> Unless you're going to live to 100. You're like, oh, man. Yeah, it's, 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 uh, Right. Exactly. Right. Back then, you might, you know, unless you were in the older patriarchs, you might have had several of them. But yeah, you were supposed to be observing these. Thus, a marker is established so that we may mark off time by counting these jubilees made up of seven sevens. Seven times seven shemitah cycles is forty-nine years. Then 49 plus the marker year, you're going to put the marker in there, the Jubilee is 50 years. So any questions on that? Does that make sense that we've now got a bigger marker? And it's, a, it's more manageable through time, right? That you can go back and say, this, is a, this was a Jubilee, this was a Jubilee. Now the question is, what is the significance of the Jubilee? Well, we have some menorahs here. Two, three, four, five, six, seven lampstands. Ta da! That's <laughs> good. <laughs> so, could it be that the seven lampstands that Yeshua walks amongst also represent the significance of his arrival at the counting of the last jubilee? There's going to be a last jubilee, all right? And the trumpets are going to blow. Will Yeshua announce his reign with the loud shofar in the seventh month, proclaiming liberty for his people throughout the earth? Something to think about. So, Look how that Jubilee cycle fits in there just beautifully. So do you guys currently know when the Jubilee is? Do you, do you Don't know that either. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of speculation. No one knows I've, the time I've been working at it. I've been crunching the numbers here. Uh, yeah, there are some good ideas out there. Yeah, there are. Good. Interesting yeah. ideas. We're not even going to speculate to say, right? the real coin. Well, they were thinking that there was some math, you know, people doing math saying they thought this fall cycle was going to be something special. That it may mark something because, you know, different markers without going, you know, leaving this too much. But, you know, everybody was looking. So, so as you see on the top of the lampstands, I marked <laughs> off the years. And if you line them up, if each one of those candles or those lamps in the lamp stand represented a year, you would end up with a perfect count of a jubilee, with Yeshua arriving at the end of the 49th year, proclaiming the jubilee year. With his shofar. With his shofar. Trumpets. Well, seven trumpets. Well, no, there's seven trumpets to be blown. The last trump is the, the last trumpet, is the big one. So. Hebrews are good at counting to seven. We can define that. Now you may understand why our Heavenly Father has asked us to segment time into sevens. Anything beyond a seven count is time beyond time. Now I want you guys to keep that in mind. I'm going to take you somewhere a little later in the lesson. But what we seem to do is count to seven. We don't move into an eight. We come back around. We start the cycle. It's it's a cycle. It's cylindrical. We come back. We come back. There is no eighth day counted during the Feast of Sukkot. The reason this confusion exists is because of the vague references that are found in the Torah. Leviticus 23, 36, On the eighth day shall be a holy convocation unto you, and you shall offer an offering made by fire to Yahovah. It is a solemn assembly, and you shall do no servile work therein. 
what is this solemn assembly that he speaks of? Well, the word used here is actually the Hebrew word atzorit. It's a very special word. It's not used that often. I think total, is it even, is it even ten times in the whole, script, or the whole scripture? So the two words translated as solemn assembly are both No. Hebrew? Well, yeah, yeah, I guess, yeah, I should say that, yeah. <laughs> they, they put the word solemn in there. Okay. What was the reference on that, Keith? I apologize. It's, it's Leviticus 23, was it 16? Well, here's the Strong's number. I threw that in there. So it means a gathering or assembly. The Hebrew word Shemini, eight, is added to say it is the assembly on the eighth day. So they call it Shemini Atzeret. Okay? Or Atzeret. So the Shemini Atzeret, we have other feast days. So what about those feast days? What do they call those? So the other set apart feast days are called holy convocations. They're called Kodesh Mikra in the Hebrew. They use a different word for those. Meaning a reading or a calling together. And there's the Strong's numbers for those. So here we have during these feast days, or the festivals that God has uh, asked us to keep, in Scripture, He gives some of the special, we call them high Sabbaths, the days during the feast that we are supposed to uh, not work and actually uh, be at the temple. He gave them different names. So what we're going to do is take a closer look at the Moedim, or the appointed times in the seventh month on the biblical Hebrew calendar. And we're going to compare what days are assigned as Sabbaths and what <coughs> Hebrew word was given to them, either Kodesh Mikra or Atzerit. So here is the, the calendar I did up. And if you look, we start over here. On the first day of the seventh month, we have the Day of Trumpets, Yom Turah. It is a high Sabbath, but it is called a holy convocation. It's called the Kodesh Mikra. Anything with the black S under it is known as the Kodesh Mikra. Then we come over to this day, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. It also is on, it's on the 10th day. It also is a Kodesh Mikra. Then we start our Festival of Booths. It starts on the 15th day with a holy convocation. We, we have a dwelling in our sukkah for seven days, and that will take us to the 21st. Then, on this day, the 22nd, we are told to have a solemn assembly on Atzerit. Does that make sense? Everybody see this? And I just threw in here the name Shemini Atzerit, it is the eighth day, but it also has another name, the last great day. We're going to talk about the last great day. Why is it called the last great day? Well, in John 7, that chapter is all about Yeshua talking about going up to Jerusalem. His brothers ask him, hey, are you going yet? You know, and it's all about the feasts coming up the Feast of Tabernacles, that he was going to go up and attend the Feast of Tabernacles. Those earlier uh, high Sabbaths that I showed you in the month, you don't have to be at the Temple Mount for those. You could still be in Jerusalem, and Yeshua was down in the Galilee. He came up towards the beginning of the feast days and went up to Jerusalem. So John is sure to testify that it is the greatest day, the last or the greatest day, the Atzeri, at the end of Tabernacles. And here's what he says in John 7, 37. On the last and greatest day of the feast, Yeshua stood up and cried out loudly, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Now there's speculation why he said this. Anybody ever hear why he was saying this? Well, they, 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 some people say that happened on the last day of Sukkot. It wasn't on that day, so I don't know. 
but huh no i haven't i haven't been able to i truly identify when they they placed that in i i was looking at things and they were some of the vague things i was reading was like that was during the end of sukkot not on this day but you see it's hard because it's vague because you don't know yeah. what what day they're calling out on that now the hebrew word atsuri the root of this word comes from the Hebrew word atsar. And that means to enclose or hold back, also maintain, rule, or assemble. It's very interesting talking about enclosing or holding back. And it's because when Sukkot finishes, you could take down your sukkah and, you know. You would, you're not going to leave. You're going to hold back from leaving for this final assembly. The word, when we talk about even when it was given to um, Moses, there was a thing called Paleo-Hebrew, and this is the letters they used when they wrote the language and they read from right to left. So that word that we're saying that Atzerit would be spelled with these letters. The Hebrew letters would be uh, Ayin, Sad, Tasad, Resh, and Tav. So we're going to look at what they mean. And if you take the first letter and it means to see and then to desire, Resh is the head or the highest, and then Tav is the seal or the covenant. And you would read it from right to left, and they would get a meaning out of the word picture there. So in Hebrew, when we assemble for this special atzerit on the eighth day, we are gathering because we desire to see the head of the covenant. That's what that word comes out to be with the word pictures, with, with the actual uh, Paleo-Hebrew. By keeping Elohim's feast, we are showing him our heart's desire to please him and to see him. So what's special about the eighth day? This day has great significance with Yahuwah's covenant. It's the day that the mark of the covenant is received after the birth of a male child. A seven-day count begins, followed by the eighth day when blood is shed and a mark is given and his name is sealed. Circumcision. I didn't say it up there. <laughs> I didn't know if there was going to be kids. <laughs> they know what it is, Daddy. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, if Messiah was born on the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles, then the seven-day count would have continued until the end of the Feast of Sukkot, then his parents would have had him circumcised on the eighth day. He would have received his mark on a day with great significance. In Levit Leviticus 9, verses 1 through 24, you'll find that numerous things began for Israel when the tabernacle service uh, began on the eighth day. There were seven days prior to that that they were consecrating the temple, they were the tabernacle. They were doing a lot of work. You can read all the different things they were doing, but the eighth day came, and that was the first day Aaron stood as the high priest and blessed the children of Israel. Was that during the Feast of Tabernacles? Mm, I, I, just, I, something that happened after a seven-day count on the eighth day? Yeah. Uh, it, it, I don't think it happened exactly on the feast, but 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 it was the fact that you know it's always been when you're reading scripture. Whenever they go to renew the the temple, they always have to do all the uh, cleaning up, and you know, and then on the eighth day, that's when it's open for business. It was the day that the Levitical priesthood began their service. So this is after uh, about a year after. Moses got all the information, they made all the utensils, put the tabernacle together and everything. And then on the eighth day, 
It was the first day of the daily offering, the morning and evening lambs. This was the day that the glory of Yahuwah's presence appeared to all the people. This was the day that fire came from Yahuwah and consumed the offering on the altar before all the people, and they shouted and fell on their faces. It's also related to um, some Hebrews celebrating uh, Hanukkah as a, as a celebration that's dedicated to the rededication. Right, that they, that they did in like 167 B.C. So the tabernacle service on the eighth day. Someone took a shot and I got the photo for it, and that was what it looked like. <laughs> they needed the special picture back there. Mm -hmm. I think it's called painting. And you can see all the tribes are in their tents all around the tabernacle. Also, we had lepers were also clean on the eighth day. And the scripture that talks about the lepers being cleansed is in Leviticus 14. These instructions explain in detail the events over the seven days, you know, that the leper has to do. But finally, leading up to the le lepers cleansing on the eighth day. The cleansing doesn't happen until the eighth day. So we'll look at two verses. And they read like this. 14.10 reads, and on the eighth day he shall take two lambs without blemish, and one ewe lamb of the first year without blemish, and three-tenths of an ephah of fine flour for a meat offering, mingled with oil and one log of oil. 14.11 And the priest that maketh him clean shall present the man that is to be made clean, and those things, all the things we just talked about, have to be brought before Yahuwah at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And then he is cleansed and his leprosy goes away. And that happens on the eighth day. Of course, we know that's no problem. Yeshua came down. He was cleaning up leprosy left and right, right? He, so that is one of the blessings and there, there's the door to the tabernacle where the leper would be cleansed. It's also significant to note that leprosy is not what we think of. As right. They would be left as not considered for leprosy. Well, it's interesting that the unclean becomes clean at the door of the tabernacle, and who is the door? Yes. Are you going to go there? Okay. Yeshua. No. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I, so we, the unclean, become clean when we go to the door. Yes. Because Yeshua said, I am the door. And on the eighth day, we get to get out of our temporary tabernacles. The flesh is cut off. And circumcision, mm -hmm. yeah. A lot of significance there. What, what were you going to say about the skin stuff? I'm not, I'm not sure I know the leprosy that you were referring to. Oh, you mean the biblical leprosy yeah. as opposed to what we have today with the Right. Uh, in my understanding, at least from a from a rabbinic perspective, is that uh, and this is common amongst even um, Christian commentators. It's apparently known somehow. I don't know exactly how, but um, that the disease that the Bible is calling leprosy is not related to the skin disease that we call leprosy today. It is actually a spiritual affliction with a physical manifestation. So that makes sense. And it so it's mostly, hyper rash, not a flesh eating. Yeah, okay. and it was most notably associated with gossip. And the reason that the, the rabbinics have come to that conclusion is because when Miriam and Aaron began to talk trash about Moses, she was immediately oh. stricken with leprosy for seven days and had to be cleansed on the eighth day. The whole camp of Israel had to stop and wait for Miriam to get cleansed from talking evil speech about her brother. And I think it also is related to pride. Um, just to talk about those swords being lifted up and raising up in this like prideful way, and I think the words are what's associated. So yeah. I think there's yeah. some kind of connection to what you're talking about, or being pr proud of heart. Yeah. Are you uh, demonic also, or uh, is it going you know, too far? I, well, not necessarily. I don't know, but I will tell you this, that I, I have become more and more convinced that evil speech will manifest itself physically. It, it happens. 
I, it does not the same way as in the scripture where there's something on the skin that you, you know. But it's a good thing, otherwise everybody with a Facebook account would have yeah. a rash. Uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> like, Look, that guy's got <laughs> Facebook. <laughs> Seriously, I know. You've been gossiping again. I think that it can and absolutely will manifest itself physically. Well, the, there was another connection that uh, when you speak about somebody and you gossip about them, naturally that person is going to withdraw from the group. Um, whether they know you said it or not, they're going to get that feeling and they're going to become isolated from the group that are all... So what happens with the leper is because of that skin thing, they now are the ones that are isolated from the group. So it's almost like a tetraback thing mm -hmm. going on. That's like karma. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Keith. Well, let's look at the number eight in Hebrew, since we're on the eight. <coughs> Hebrews do not have separate numbers like the Romans do. Hebrews use the letters in their alphabet to represent numbers. So the letter used for the number eight, the eighth letter, that's how they do it. They take the eighth letter in their alphabet, and that becomes the number eight, and it's het, het. You say it like, say the C-H as in Bach, so you say het. I didn't get any out of you, did I? You, you would only say it like that if you were yelling in clubs, though. <laughs> the het. The het's Hebrew meaning is to separate, keep private, like a fence or an inner room. And there is what it looks like in the Paleo uh, language. When, it, when they learned the Hebrew, they would draw it. It looks like a wall or a fence, and it means separation. So why can't we enter into the eighth day this time beyond time? Well, I'll just coin that phrase. So we learned that the Hebrew letter het has a numerical value of eight. It also means to separate. It actually looks like a fence in ancient Hebrew script. This is because the eighth day is a day of separation. It marks the end of the seventh day, but we do not normally enter into an eighth day with our count. We start at the beginning of a new cycle of seven. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Pretty heavy? What is the Hebrew word for father? And we're going to look at the paleo. It's the aleph and the big. So hang on. I have to ask a question for this one. So if they count in sevens, is it's a rarity that they go to eight, and then when they fit, is eight really one, or do they go eight and then they start with seven again? It's well, like I'll show you. I'm, we're just taking the, the basic cycles, the way that I was showing you to keep track of things. Mm -hmm. Because normally, yeah, we know that people do count days and months, and we, you know, but as far as the cycle that Yahovah would have us keep, knowing, knowing the, the extra days or whatever, you're trying to keep track of the, the appointed times, right? So it would, it would be the eighth day of the month, but the first day of... The next Sabbath the cycle, okay. yeah. But the thing is about this eight here is... The fact that when you do get to the eighth day, you don't really count it as the eighth day. You start a new cycle in your mind to count sevens again. And then when we look here, you're going to see something neat here with the word for father is ab, because the elf has an ah sound and the bait has a b sound. So we would say ab is our father's name in Hebrew. It's aleph means strong, strength, or leader. And then bait means the family or the house. So out of that, you get the leader of the house, or he is the strength of the family. I've heard it either way. The father is the strength of the family or the leader of the house. And we live in a house that he created, and he is our heavenly father of all mankind. Do you know our father's true nature? Well, we're going to take his name, <clears throat> that we just learned, and the word for love is ahab. And we get that by placing a hay in the middle of father. So that, word, that letter hay means to behold or reveal or his breath. So if we take 
the same letters and put the hay in between them, what we do is we get the Father revealed, so the meaning could be the Father revealed, or just keep this in mind as when we get towards the end of the teaching, it also means the Father or the leader to reveal his house. Yeah, so the Father's essence is love because if you look, it's in the middle, it's revealed, and we, we know that. We know that everything that comes out of Scripture is all about love, the commandments. The scribe asked Yeshua, which is the first commandment of all? And in Mark 12, 29, Yeshua answered him, Hear, O Israel, Yahovah Elohim, Yahovah is one. That word one is ichad, and it means unified. You shall love Yahovah, your Elohim, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second one is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Now, it doesn't mean there's not any other commandments. There are other commandments. He's saying... But this is the basis of all commandments. They're the greatest. So what is this love's numeric value? Let's look at love. And we're going to go back to that Hebrew word we learned, ahab. And you can say ahab, but to keep it simple for people seeing it the first time, the, that letter can be a B or a V, depending. So we're going to use the B. And... It's Aleph, the hay is 5, and the bait is 2. If you add up the total, it's 8. Weren't we just talking about 8s? <laughs> Very unique that this value is 8. This number 8 also helps define his loving relationship with us. So let's do a quick review. 8 in Hebrew seems to represent having a relationship with our Heavenly Father through His covenant. It's clear to see that a lot of special things happen around the tabernacle on the eighth day. They were to count to 8 only when the tabernacle and His presence was involved because there is a barrier of separation between us and His presence and only His priests were allowed to enter. But there is a time in the future that he will reveal himself to us if we keep his commandments. Time in the future. Is there not a millennium count? Have you guys heard about the millennium count? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, the, we're going we're gonna to talk about where this is based. In 2 Peter... Uh, 3, 8, but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day with Yahovah is a as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. And in Psalm 90 it says, for a thousand years in thy sight are but as a day when it is past and as a watch in the night. Right. Yeah, we, we, we Oh, yeah. <laughs> so this is what the millennial week will, it looks like. Are we back to a seven? Look at the seven count. So day one, we've got a thousand years under it, showing everyone that this is a marker here of a thousand years, this span from, we, we guesstimate 4,000 B.C. We say it was creation. There's day one, day two, day three, day four. Look at that marker there. That's what we call the marker between uh, the, the common air and before the common air. Or AD and BC. AD, BC, okay. Then we've got day five and day six, and then day seven. So let's take a look here. Genesis 2, verse 16 and 17. And Yahovah commanded Adam, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou may freely eat, but 
of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So, if that, that word there, for in the day, we know that Adam went on to live past that human day of 24 hours, and he died at 930 years old. Okay? He died just before the end of the thousandth year day that Yahuwah speaks of. So he actually died somewhere right here before this marker of the second day. But now we're going to look in Genesis, and Alan was alluding to this here. Yahuwah said, My spirit shall not contend with mankind forever, for they are flesh. Therefore shall their days be 120 years. Okay? So, what does that mean? Well, years was translated from the Hebrew word shana, and shana means a cycle or revolution of time. And a lot of times they translate it as year because they go, wow, we went around the sun once, that's a revolution, uh, it's a year. Okay? Since Noah and his sons and their offspring lived lifespans much longer than 120 years, we know that this is not the time cycle Yahuwah was talking about. Now, the Jubilee is a 50-year marker that can easily be used to dissect time into decent-sized chunks. So keep that in mind. We're going to be looking at Jubilees. But I took in, under the first day, I wrote that there, this would fit in. If a Jubilee is 50 years, 20 times 50 would give you 1,000. Okay, keep that in mind. So 120 Jubilees from here to here is 120 jubilees, because that's 120 times 50 gives you 6,000 years. He will contend with man for 120 shana. And that is the uh, strong number, shana, a division or a measure of time. The longest measure that was given to us to count is a jubilee. So jubilees fit in here perfectly. 120 times 50 gives you 6,000. And it's easy to see that there was, there was some thought going into this when these things were laid out, this cycle of sevens and the thousand years and the millennial days. And the prophet prophesied, what did he prophesy? He prophesied that after two days he will revive us and on the third day he will raise us up and we will live in his presence. And that's from Hosea, Hosea 6.2. So here we go. Here's the marker. After two days, after two days, now that's, I was going to talk about my note here. After two days, the zero marker is almost two days of time has passed since Messiah announced the king, coming of his kingdom. Back here around the zero marker, Messiah announced the coming of his kingdom. We've got one, two days. We're somewhere here. Remember I told you that wherever this started, we don't know exactly. This is just a marker. We're thinking it started 4,000, but that's not necessarily... But if we count Jubilees, which we've been keeping track the whole time, yeah, we would know when the last Jubilee is. We would know, this is the 120th Jubilee. Yay. Right? We're in, or we're in the 119th Jubilee. We've got 50 years, right? Uh, but not so lucky. I don't think we know that. I but, didn't know that we'd be celebrating if we did anyway. <laughs> the events described in the book of Revelation did not So we're somewhere here, and... And what we're looking at is Yeshua speaks of his kingdom. In Matthew 8.11, he says, And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west. Now people are coming from the east and the west to the kingdom, and they shall sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Now, that was I was always curious about that because... 
you know, we know they're the patriarchs and they're definitely going to be there. But he's, he's just saying, they're already there. They, you will be sitting down with them, okay? It's not a question. It's just when do you, if you get there to come sit down with them? And are they already there, I ask? Because Yeshua did raise and bring up first fruits with him. So, so the Sabbath millennium in Revelation 20, verse 6, Blessed are the holy, blessed and holy, and holy are those that take part in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them. They shall be priests of Yahovah and Messiah, and they shall reign with him for a thousand years. Okay? So we're going to reign with him for a thousand years. So this becomes the Sabbath day. So that pattern exists right here, that Sabbath pattern we were learning. A thousand years with Messiah is the Sabbath's rest. Right? But there is a time in the future that our Father will reveal Himself to us if we keep His commandments. In Revelation 21, 2, And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from Yahovah, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. That is what is this time after a thousand years. It's day eight. The time beyond time. This just keeps going. We don't have any, we have no idea what that looks like, okay? It's Olam. May we be in Yahovah's presence forever, and there is New Jerusalem coming down. Yeah. Is there anything about the marriage ceremony on in an eighth day? Or is it half and final day or last or seven in the marriage? I didn't go into that. Okay. I was trying uh, there's just so much. I mean this <laughs> this this teaching can be expounded on. Well next year I'll start <laughs> <laughs> So yeah. so here we're looking at this period of time, this eighth day, the Shemini Atsarit, the assembly on the eighth day, New Jerusalem arrives in a special assembly on the eighth day. Okay? And that's what this day represents in that picture. The time beyond time arrives, for it is the eighth day. So it's beyond that fence? It's be we're past the fence. Okay? The, the het. The fence represented by the number eight. I heard a loud voice from the throne say, Behold, the tabernacle of Yahovah is among men, and he shall tabernacle among them. They shall be his people, and Yahovah himself shall be with them and be their Elohim. So on the eighth day, the, the new Jerusalem arrives. Yahovah is there. We shall have a last great day, a Shemini Atzerit, an assembly on the eighth day with Yahovah. Now you remember back when Yeshua offered those who thirst a drink in the temple on the eighth day? Revelation 22, verse 1, And he showed me a river filled with the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing out from the throne of God and the Lamb. So that is the water that came Yeshua was offering on the eighth day. Did you already quote that scripture when I was out of the room? What's that? The one where he stood up on the last great day. Yeah, okay. that, that he, he said anybody who wants to is thirsty come to me. This, was it a shadow picture of this day when all will drink freely from the Lamb of God? May we live in His light with peace forevermore. Revelation 22, verse 5, There will be no more night, and there will not need any light from the lamps or light from the sun, because Yahovah will shine on them. They will, 
They shall reign forever and ever. May we be in Yahovah's presence forever. And there's the light coming out from, from there. And that's a, a picture, too, of, of the first day of creation, that light that was not of the sun and the moon, but Yahovah. And Revelation also says that the Lamb is the lamp thereof. So. And so that, that is the teaching that this day represents something even farther in the future, this, this last great day, the eighth the eighth day of assembly. And then, I thought that was pretty nice to cap it off. <laughs> so that's it. Any questions? Very nice. Thank you so Thanks. much. Thanks.